In the 18th century, scientists thought that the first defining attribute that would make us human was our big brain. From birth to preschool, our brains quadruple in size. They reach 90% of their final size by six years old, and they continue to grow slowly through adolescence until stopping in our mid-20s. The brain is an incredibly complex organ. It has convoluted surface and different areas that control different parts of our functions or what we're able to do. Three major hypotheses or groups of hypotheses have been proposed on how and why the human brain enlarged. The first is the social brain hypothesis or tool use. The second, the expensive tissue hypothesis. And the third group looks at genetic changes that cause bigger brains. The social brain hypothesis states that humans and other primates evolved big brains in response to the social challenges of living in large groups. The cognitive and neurosciences fields have long assumed that big brains evolved to process factual information about the world. Most attention has therefore been focused on such features as pattern recognition, color vision, and speech perception. By extension, it was assumed that brains evolved to deal with essentially ecological problem-solving tasks. So according to the social brain hypothesis, the brain size constrains the size of the social network. And the neocortex plays a major role in our information processing capacity. We have a constraint on our memory for relationships. Humans are said to be able to attach names to around 2,000 faces, but have a cognitive group size of only about 150. So we have a constraint on our social skills to manage relationships. Although newborns rely heavily on their families, as humans get older, we increasingly learn to be self-sufficient, using tools and learning about our environments. So scientists speculate that both of these habits, our social relationships and tool use and learning about environment, contribute to brain growth, but they don't know which of these factors or others have the greatest bearing. Recently, an evolutionary biologist has created a mathematical model to allow scientists to quantitatively compare these hypotheses. The model states that as adult brain mass increases, so too does adult skill, assuming that the costs of maintaining the brain mass and memory stay constant. However, there's no intrinsic reason to suppose that memory per se is the issue. If you think about it, the social brain hypothesis is about the ability to manipulate information, not simply to remember it. The expensive tissue hypothesis states that the brain could not enlarge until some other expensive tissue got smaller. The adult human brain is considered to be an expensive tissue. That is, it weighs only about 2% of our body weight, but it consumes about 20% of the total energy intake in oxygen and sugars. In other words, our brain demands 20% of our resting metabolic rate. So the brain is an expensive tissue. Ounce for ounce, it uses nine times more energy than the rest of the body on average. Energy travels to the brain via blood vessels in the form of glucose, which is transported across the blood-brain barrier and used to produce ATP, the main currency of chemical energy within cells. It's not just the brain. Five of our major organ systems are considered to be expensive tissue. That is, they constitute only a small percentage of our body mass, but they use 60 to 70% of our body's energy. These are the heart, the liver, kidney, 
gastrointestinal tract or gut, and brain. So the expensive tissue hypothesis states that the brain could not enlarge until some other expensive tissue got smaller. That is, the human body can take in only so much energy, and there's only so much energy to go around. But the heart, the liver, and the kidney are scaled to our body mass. That leaves potentially only the gastrointestinal tract, or the gut. Could it reduce in size? Well, we believe that the gastrointestinal tract potentially can reduce or did reduce when you eat a higher quality food, such as when humans began to eat more meat, or when you partially digest your food before you eat it. For example, when humans began to cook food, or both together. So at what point in our evolutionary history do we see more meat that is a higher quality diet and more processed, easier to digest food? We believe we see the brain expansion associated with the shrunken gastrointestinal tract in Homo erectus. On the left, you can see an Australopithecus skeleton and on the right, a Homo erectus skeleton. Now, of course, our gastrointestinal tract has not been preserved in the fossil record. We have to rely on other clues, such as the shape of our rib cage. Note the change in shape of rib cage from Australopithecines on the left to Homo erectus on the right. The Australopithecine rib cage flared out at the bottom. It was cone shaped. Potentially, such a shape would allow for a very large gastrointestinal tract. And indeed, John Gershay's reconstruction of Australopithecus shows a very large belly. Whereas Homo erectus is the first with the change in the shape of the rib cage to the barrel shaped rib cage that we have today. Homo erectus also has a substantially larger cranial capacity than did the hominins before it. This chart shows the mean cranial capacities in milliliters with Australopithecines on the bottom, Homo habilis up toward the top, and Homo erectus at the top. If you look at the mean cranial capacities for three different species of Australopithecus, you can see that they range between 420 to 444 milliliters. Whereas the mean cranial capacities for Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis range from 616 to 789 milliliters. And the cranial capacity for Homo erectus is substantially larger at 917 milliliters. We can compare the skulls, Australopithecine skulls versus Homo habilis skulls, including the unusually large Homo rudolfensis, which we are uh, considering to be a type of Homo habilis, versus Homo erectus. And in the lower right, you can see also archaic human and modern human. So why could the Homo erectus gastrointestinal tract have been smaller? Well, we know that they successfully hunted small to large size game. And so they consumed substantially more meat than did Homo habilis before them. And uh, some of the better cuts of meat that Homo habilis was incapable of hunting. Homo erectus controlled fire and cooked food, making it easier to digest that food. And they made a variety of tools. They were able to cut up and prepare foods, also making food easier to digest. So even though their face and teeth were smaller, than the Australopithecines or Homo habilis before them, their prepared food, prepared by cutting up and cooking, means that less effort was needed to digest the food. And their higher quality diet, that is more meat, meant that more energy was available. So we believe that their diet of cut up food, high in cooked meat, meant 
that a smaller gastrointestinal tract was possible. And a diet with more meat means that the small intestine lengthened and the large intestine shortened, since meat takes less time in the large intestine to digest. So if the gut is smaller, the rib cage shape can change. It can squeeze in toward its base, that is be barrel shaped like ours, rather than remain conical shaped like it was among the Australopithecines. In other words, the change that we see in the rib cage shape in the fossil record of Homo erectus indicates when we got a smaller gut. The gut was not preserved, but the shape of the rib cage can indicate to us the size of the gut. So having a smaller gut, that is one of the other expensive tissues, could have freed up energy to allow the brain, another expensive tissue, to increase in size. One sidebar from this hypothesis is that now researchers know that muscles and brains have traded off energy costs. So in the last six million years, people have evolved weaker muscles much more rapidly, eight times faster than the rest of our body has changed. Compared to some other primates, humans shuttle more creatine to our brain and less to our skeletal muscles. Creatine fuels metabolism. In other words, we supply energy to the brain at expense of other parts like our shrunken gastrointestinal tract as well as our muscles. A relatively large brain could not be achieved without a corresponding increase in dietary quality unless the metabolic rate was correspondingly increased. The third group of hypotheses, and these would not be mutually exclusive to the expensive tissue hypothesis, look at genetic changes that could cause bigger brains. The first of these is looking at the NOTCH2 NL genes. Humans have three nearly identical genes that affect brain growth. These are the NOTCH2 NL, A, B, and C genes. Now in the common ancestor of all great apes, there was just one gene, the NOTCH2 gene. But at some point when it was duplicating, it did not duplicate completely, only partially creating the first NOTCH2 NL gene, which was missing important sections, and so it didn't work properly. It was useless. And to this date, chimps and gorillas still have these dead versions of the NOTCH2 NL gene. But between three and four million years ago, in the ancestors of humans, something special happened. The original NOTCH2 gene partly overrode its broken duplicate. This process, known as gene conversion, revived the NOTCH2 NL and allowing it to play an active role in human biology. And having been resurrected, it duplicated twice more, creating the A, B, and C genes that we have today. And this gene works to increase the size of our brains. Now, it's not the only gene that does so. However, the stretch of DNA where these genes reside is very unstable. And even today, sometimes it gets duplicated, sometimes it gets deleted, and other problems occur. And it's thought that these genetic upheavals can lead to developmental disorders such as macrocephaly or microcephaly, and perhaps can be linked to autism, schizophrenia, and other intellectual disorders. A second gene that affects the brain is the ARHGAP11B big brain gene. After splitting from chimpanzees, a single letter, that is one codon of our genome switched to another, creating a particular gene called ARHGAP11B. This gene increases the number of neurons in the neocortex, which is the seat of cognitive abilities such as language and logical thinking. So it's a type of neuroprogenitor cell a stem cell that divides and then forms brain cells during embryonic development. Humans, Neanderthals, and Denisovans have this gene, but chimpanzees do not. 
There is still so much we don't know about the brain because it is so incredibly complex that even modern day computers can't handle the size of the data. Flies, for example, have about 135,000 neurons, whereas macaques, a type of old world monkey, have about 6 billion neurons. But humans have over 80 billion neurons. Magnetic resonance imaging is now allowing us to better map parts of the brain, but again, we really know very little about the brain. One set of researchers compared human to chimpanzee brains, and they found the two brains to be remarkably similar, except that the human brain is about three times as big as the brain of the chimpanzee. And moreover, the part of the brain called the cerebral cortex, which plays a key role in memory, attention, awareness, and thought, contains twice as many cells in humans as in the same region in chimpanzees. Additionally, networks of brain cells in the cerebral cortex behave differently between the two species. So how or when do these differences arise? Well, progenitor cells that form the human cerebral cortex spend around 50% more time in a stage of the cell division process called metaphase compared to the same cells from chimpanzees. So we're getting down to mitosis. Humans have a larger neocortex than do chimps because the rate of mitosis in human brain stem cells has been lengthened, and in particular during the S phase of mitosis. This is a proliferative phase, meaning that as a result, during growth, humans produce more neurons in the brain. In other words, a small change in the rate of development during mitosis has a huge impact on the size of human brains. If you look, the human cerebral cortex is over four times larger than our closest living relative, the chimpanzee, and we have over two and a half times as many neurons. I thought you might be interested to also see the difference between the size of the human and the elephant brain. Of course, the elephant brain is much larger but the number of neurons is much higher in humans than in elephants or chimpanzees. A big brain trio hypothesis has been um, proposed. This states that certain genetic features have led to the convergent evolution of large brains and complex cognition in a handful of species, including dolphins, humans, and elephants. All three have genes that support a slow molecular rate, which is tied to mammals whose life histories include large generation times and large parental investment. All three have nervous system genes that improve the quality of the brain. And all three have molecular signatures of metabolism evolution. In other words, ideas that support the expensive tissue hypothesis. To summarize, undoubtedly human cranial capacity has increased through time. And being bipedal and having a large brain means that birth could be difficult, and in fact it is. The baby must be born very immature with a smaller brain to fit through the birth canal. That brain must then grow as the baby grows larger. So infant brains increase in size during the first 20 some years of life. But how could adult human brains have evolved to become so large relative to our body size? Today I've summarized three different sets of hypotheses. We began with the social brain or tool use hypothesis, which states that humans and other primates evolved big brains in response to the social challenges of living in large groups and or using tools. And if you recall, when we talked about tools, how symmetrical complex tools such as the Achillean hand axe um, may, led people to manipulate their hands in ways that also affected the structure of the brain. I then talked about the expensive tissue hypothesis, which I expect you to know and understand. This states that human brains are one of five expensive tissues in the body, that is tissues that don't take up much space in the body, but use most of the energy. For the brain to expand, some other expensive tissue must first shrink. 
And I've already spoken about why the heart, the liver, and the kidney cannot shrink because they're related to our body size. And in fact, we think that the gastrointestinal tract or the gut shrunk and it was among the Homo erectus that this occurred. And then I talked about a number of genetic changes that contribute to large complex brains. That is unique human genes that can contribute to why our brains are so large and so complex.